You are listening to the Final Say Radio Show, a Rappaport Media production, with your host Brett Rappaport and co-host John Rappaport. Dan Caldwell is the Legislative Director for Concerned Veterans for America. Dan, first of all, I want to welcome you with uh, Brett and John Rappaport on the Final Say Radio Show, and uh, thank you so much for joining us this afternoon. Well, thank you for having me on. Now, Dan, uh, you guys are having a an event. Well, one of the main reasons that we have you on today is to help promote an event that you guys are doing next week uh, in Washington, D.C. on uh, Tuesday, December 2nd. Concerned Veterans for America and the Weekly Standard will host a national security policy forum uh, entitled, What Should Modern American Foreign Policy Look Like? And first of all, thank you for doing this. And um, I'll give you the opportunity to share some of the uh, wonderful names and people who will be participating in this, as well as you guys. But um, f- first of all, why, why are you guys doing this, and what are some of the key topics that will be discussed? Well, this is the official launch event of our Strength and Security Project, which we uh, rolled out on September 11th of this year. Um, our Strength and Security Project, is part of our our national security um, project. It basically is our national security project. It's the vehicle through which Concerned Veterans for America is going to be talking about national security and defense reform issues. Um, you know, Concerned Veterans for America, since our inception, we primarily focus on fiscal uh, and VA reform issues and Department of Defense fiscal reform issues, and, and not necessarily national security issues, although many of our members for, and staff for a long time have been involved with national security foreign policy issues for a long time. Um, you know, again, many of most of our members and staff uh, have served in the military, served overseas, so we have a lot of experience in kind of that realm, and with all the chaos we've seen around the world, all the fiscal issues within the Department of Defense, we decided to create this project and to launch it. And this event, which is going to feature Senator Ted Cruz uh, as our keynote speaker, uh, is designed to basically uh, bring a lot of different perspectives from the the pro-freedom side of the House on foreign policy and what it should look like. Everybody at this event isn't going to agree on everything, but I think if you go to the event or you watch it online and you can go and and find out more details at cv4a.org or website, you'll see that, that... even if you're more of a non-interventionist uh, type of person or somebody who believes that the United States should play a more active role in the world, you'll walk away seeing that there's a lot of agreement across that spectrum, particularly that we don't really have a clear and coherent foreign policy right now under the Obama administration, and that, that we really need to define ultimately what should be the goal of our American national security strategy. And this event is going to have, uh, in addition, Senator Ted Cruz. You're going to have Congressman Tom McClintock from California, uh, Congressman Adam Kissinger from Illinois. We'll also have uh, Bill Crystal, who is the editor of the Week, um, Dr. Will Ruger from the Charles Koch Institute, uh, Michael Hanlon from the Brookings Institute, and James Car- Carafano from Heritage Foundation. So you're going to get a wide array of thoughts and ideas at this event, it's not just going to be an echo chamber where everybody's reading off the same script. So it's going to be very inform- informative. I uh, encourage, if you're in the D.C. area, to RSVP for our website. And if you can't attend, you can also watch it online as well. Yeah, um, and what a lineup, i got to tell you. We, we've interviewed a, a couple of those fellows over time. And, in fact, James Carafano has been on the program for, uh, for gosh, for five or six years I've been interviewed. Right. And uh, he's got such a depth of knowledge and experience. And I think this is going to be an excellent event, which is it caught my eye, and I, I really wanted to have you guys on to discuss and promote it because I've been to a, a couple of these types of events, and you learn so much from them. But it, it's not just what you learn. It's, like as you said, having the discussion and having different points of view discussing these topics because, um, you know, it seems to me a lot gets said behind the doors, but what – what kind of conversations are we having that the American people and and the people who are most impacted by these decisions, like when do we get to watch it, you know, because you're going to stream this or or put out a a podcast of some sort. And so it gives people an opportunity to get an education that they might not otherwise get, and that's very important. And, again, we appreciate that you're doing that. 
Well, I, I appreciate all that, and, and uh, it, we're, this is going to be the first in a series of events that we're going to be doing. We, we've done events like this in the past. Uh, we call them our Defend and Reform Series. Um, they focus on everything from uh, VA reform to, you know, the threat that our national debt poses to our, you know, frankly, the, the national security of our country. And we'll be doing many more of these focused in the D.C. area, and we hope to have uh, a, a lot more guests in the future. In addition, uh, through the Strength and Security Project, uh, we're going to be rolling out some case studies uh, in conjunction, actually, with some of them with the Heritage Foundation and uh, James Carafano um, as well on foreign policy issues that have emerged within the United States, uh, or excuse me, you know, within the United States' uh, national security realm uh, over the past uh, decade, and, and kind of how these how these uh, uh, issues can teach us some lessons on how we should craft and shape a future national security strategy for the United States. And uh, it, it's it's uh, it's going to be hopefully a very informative series. And we're going to start making recommendations, not just on on engaging overseas, but in reforming and ultimately transforming the Department of Defense and making it more efficient. Uh, you brought up a, a, a James Carafano earlier. He just had a great article in the Daily Signal on the need for acquisition reform and how the Pentagon has wasted $46 billion, I believe, over the last 10 years on weapon systems that we ultimately canceled or didn't buy. So that's an issue that we'll be tackling as well, not just simply looking at, okay, well, should we be in this country or engage this terrorist entity or not, but those issues as well because they're just as important to our national security as, you know, Al-Qaeda and other things like that. Dan, this is John. So first off, I think foreign policy is far more important than a lot of Americans give credit to. We just went through an election cycle and you have so much uh, discussion about it's uh, jobs and the economy, stupid. But to me, that's true, except for the fact that I see national security being inseparable from the economy. It's uh, actually there to defend the economy. In fact, you could look at most people's armies over the year were there to help protect them from other people and then to protect your trade routes. And so if you look at foreign policy, I think national security is probably, if you, if you put 10 foreign policy slots out there, I would say national security should occupy the top five. Now, you specifically spoke to uh, strategy, and I think that's one of the biggest issues here is it's very difficult to have a, a foreign policy conversation if you don't actually have a very specific strategy with absolute clearly defined outcomes. For example, the U.S. will always maintain a quality of edge. The U.S. will always be able to support, uh, as we had for many years up until recently, two major, uh, uh, major wars and still deal with minor skirmishes. And it seems like we're, we're suffering here because we're playing a, a game of uh, a political whack-a-mole. Um, where where do we go from here, Dan? And I guess this is probably, to a large extent, the motivation for what you're doing. Well, it is. And, you know, going back to the end of the Cold War, you know, quite frankly, our, our group believes that you really have not had a, a either a national security consensus or, or a true national long-term security strategy since, you know, the collapse of the Soviet Union and uh, the Berlin Wall coming down. And, you know, for, for, you know, about from 1945 to 1991, the, you know, our national security strategy was, was uh, focused and defined by first containing and then under Ronald Reagan ultimately rolling back communism. And, yes, there were disagreements within that sphere and there, there were little strategy differences here and there, but that is ultimately what united and focused our national security strategy. In, in the post-Cold War world, you, you really haven't had that, and that's been under three presidents now, and we, we don't ultimately have a long-term national security vision, and we haven't really defined in, 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 a, in a manner that uh, you can unite and kind of build a consensus around on what should be our national security strategy and what should it ultimately accomplish. You know, you'll have, like, vague statements about pivoting to Asia, for example, or the need to contain Islamic terrorism or, you know, even getting into to weird things like climate change and, and, and poverty and Ebola that we've seen under this administration. Yet, 
they're really half-hearted and they're not really followed through on. And then even things when you get into how do you structure Department of Defense, you know, brought up the qualitative edge and, and things like that. Well, they'll say that we need to maintain that, or we they say we need to maintain a certain force structure, but then ultimately it's not followed through on. Like, for example, the Navy. I've been talking about the need for a 300-ship Navy now for many years. However, we are our Navy is slowly shrinking because we aren't able to build ships fast enough and we keep having cost overruns on other, on, on other projects. And so we're nowhere near that goal. Uh, and that, that's a problem. And that's one of ultimately what we're hoping to do is begin to shape the debate on the right, on the pro-freedom side of the political spectrum and, and kind of start to agree at least on some key principles behind what should American national security strategy look like. And unfortunately, and, and, and there's blame on both sides, we haven't had that. And I, I think it's because of some of the dynamics talked about earlier, is that Americans, even after 9-11, have not really taken, you know, the, the foreign policy and national security issues seriously during the election. Um, it's been one, if it, it, it happens, it, it, it's kind of a flash in the pan type thing. It's not a long-term concern, like during which you saw in the Cold War, the, the fear of, you know, Soviet domination and, frankly, nuclear annihilation. So it, it is something that both at a policy level and a grassroots level, because we're not just a Washington, D.C. organization. We have uh, most of our staff is in the field across the country out there educating veterans, military family members, and regular Americans as well on these issues. So we're hoping to drive this from both a top down and a uh, bottom up method on on these on these issues, and ultimately get to a point where we're we're starting to force that. Say, hey, we need this. We need to have a clearly defined long term national security strategy. And the fact we don't have one is actually endangering our country, both on a physical security level and, as you point out, even on an economic level as well. Dan, I'm going to combine two questions into one by making a fairly simple statement, and I want you to analyze both sides, if you will. I believe wars are won militarily, which uh, means you need an absolute commitment and a model to win. But I also think they're lost politically. And I think that's part of the issue that we have here is we have uh, so many politicians who seem to take their own political agendas over the importance of the country uh, winning wars and maybe uh, even the lives of the men and women that are spent in wars I think need to be held far more uh, precious. So I wanted to get your comment on that again. Wars are won militarily, but they're lost politically. Well, I couldn't agree with that more, to tell you the truth. And based on my own experience, I, I've, I've seen that firsthand. When I left Iraq, you know, I left Al Anbar province, and it was, it was very peaceful and, for the most part, stable. It wasn't perfect. They weren't exactly on the road to a Jefferson, uh, Jeffersonian democracy, but you didn't have the chaos and anarchy that you have there today. All these towns that you've seen on the news, you know, I was there – you know, four or five years ago. And you had nowhere near the level of violence you have now. In fact, you know, you could go months and, or weeks without an attack on either American forces or friendly Iraqi forces. And we had really in many ways won that war militarily. There was a lot of work to do with changing Iraqi forces. Now, what you had is, is when Obama came in the office, is that on the political level, the Obama administration disengaged from working with the Iraqi leadership on, you know, sec you know, politically securing the country and setting up a political system that didn't disenfranchise the Sunnis or other minorities within the country. You had, you know, this made Joe Biden the front man, for example, on Iraq. This is a guy who, prior to 2008, had literally stated breaking up the country of Iraq and, and, and dissolving it and dividing it in three different countries. So, this is the guy you're sending to Baghdad who doesn't even believe the country of Iraq should exist to be the political point man in Iraq. And it was purely a political failure. It was a failure to secure an extended sofa for the military. It was a failure to, to devote the time and energy in engaging the Iraqi leadership, ensuring they were doing the right things to maintain the stability of that country. Um, in many ways, you kind of saw the same things in Vietnam. 
uh, you're seeing some of the same things in Afghanistan. Um, militarily, there are, six, are, are troops on the ground, battalion level at the company level, and ultimately down to the squad level where a lot of this war, these wars have been fought at, they're succeeding. And yet the higher level political decision, that, particularly with the State Department and the executive branch, or well, it's a part of the executive branch, but the White House engaging and do what they need to do, that is not fair. And I, I think that your, 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 your uh, quote there is dead on in terms of, of what, what happens with a lot of these wars and how they ultimately act. Yeah, uh, Dan, this is Brad again, and I wanted to come back to a couple things which were mentioned earlier, but I wanted to introduce China and cybersecurity. Uh, you know, we mentioned the fact that, you know, we should have a Navy that has upwards of 300 vessels included in it, but also that we are up to date technologically to be able to stand against any uh, friend or foe, and, you know, because you never know when a friend will become a foe. And China has certainly been making key advances in space technology and advanced weapons, uh, nuclear weapons, submarines now. I, now they may have this you know, crazy tugboat of an aircraft carrier, but it's a start. But clearly, they're looking to push out into the Pacific and further. Uh, they're getting involved in Africa and the Middle East and, and probably South and Central America, for all we know. And so we have to look at them. But I think when we combine or when we total up the amount of force and the projection that we have, we have to consider all the threats. So I would add to China, Russia. I would add Iran. I'd add North Korea and, and all the other smaller players. But then I also add this threat of cybersecurity because we mentioned the economic impact and the importance of national security is the fact that, you know, we read an article last week from numerous uh, publications at the fact that our power grids could be taken down by the Chinese. Now, we knew the Russians could do it, but now you have two countries that could potentially take us down. Now, I'm sure we could do the same to them, but it's still a significant threat, and it means that there's a lot of infrastructure that has to be addressed, a lot of technological advances that have to be made, and, and things that have to be done. And I think you're, 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 you're both correct in that it's going to take both parties to be able to sit down in a room as adults and work together to get this done, or it's not going to happen. And then we're going to ultimately pay a significant price. Yes, you're 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 very correct uh, on the cybersecurity issue. We are we are a bit behind the curve on that, and it's it's been something where a lot in the military have had to readjust their thinking in terms of of how to deal with this threat. It's not a force on force or even you know a a counterinsurgency fight. It's 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 very it, it, it's playing out in cyberspace, which isn't something you can physically touch or bomb or blow up. Um, I will say that a lot of our cybersecurity efforts are going are to depend on working with the private very closely and working with them in, in, in conjunction. And quite frankly, to be honest with you, and I don't think this is getting a lot of attention, is there isn't a lot of trust in many cases between a lot of these private sector companies and the government at many levels. Now, you know, that's not true across the board, but, you know, there's a lot of fears about what is the NSA doing, what is, you know, what's this regulatory agency doing that could harm our company's bottom line in the future. And that, and, and to be frank with you, just the, the, the overall hostility coming from this current administration towards many in the private sector, I think ultimately hinders a lot of those efforts for them to come together and work on something like cybersecurity. You're, you're going to have to engage them. Uh, you know, the power companies, a, a lot of different um, entities are outside of the government's, you know, complete control are going to have to be key in this process in developing a real national uh, cybersecurity strategy. Um, in regards to China, um, I kind of look at the problems of China a bit differently. I, I kind of go against the conventional wisdom. Um, I look at what happened in China more as kind of a demographic problem for them. Uh, they, they have serious demographic and, frankly, economic issues that are starting to bubble up now and are going to impede their, their economic growth decade and could potentially threaten the stability of their country 10, 20 years out. Um, they have a huge male-female imbalance. You know, this is what happens when you have a policy that leads to the murder 
of you know what is estimated to be about 100 million baby girls. Um, you run into they have deep ethnic issues between the Han Chinese and other ethnic groups out in the uh, out in the western part of the country and the northern part of the country, um, and those are really driving a lot of of issues internally in China that that is going to inhibit their ability to continue to grow their military. Also say is that a lot of the projections about China and their ability to develop certain weapon systems have usually been proven incorrect or way off base. Uh, the aircraft carrier, for example, um, they're, they're behind schedule on that. Uh, the, the ballistic missile submarine, um, they, again, that's something that they've been behind on for a long time. And they, the yes on, on things like missiles and other things, they have made advances that are worrisome, uh, but they aren't. They haven't completely shifted the balance of power. So we need to we need to really kind of step back and step outside the box on China, and look at okay, well, what if what if China devolves into civil war? Again? Um, you know, not not more than you know seventy years ago, actually about sixty five years ago, China was wrapped in you know one of the deadliest civil wars of the 20th century. And they are not too far removed from that, and there's still a lot of the same tensions that drove that. So what if China goes into a civil war? What if there's a, a coup or, or, or some issue like that that drives huge unrest in, in the world's second largest economy? And how would the United States and its neighbors deal with that? So there's a lot. China is probably one of the most complex issues we face, and it's not just, well, they're building a lot of, of ships and, and their, the quality of their military is increasing. It's that they they are a tinderbox demographically, ethnically, and you know economically that that could have huge implications with stability Asia. But yeah. you I, know we need to look at all different aspects of that threat. Yeah, no, I agree, I I agree with just about everything you said. In fact, we've discussed this many times with Gordon Chang and, and uh, other experts uh, like Rick, uh, Dr. Rick Fisher, who studies the space program and, and things of that nature. But uh, we're, we're running short on time, so I really want to give you the opportunity, Dan, to, one, give the website for the organization, but also to plug the event again and make sure we get that in before we we're come up against the uh, top of the hour. So please, Dan, what's your website? CV4A.org. You can also find us uh, on Facebook at Concerned Veterans for America and then at Concerned Vets on Twitter. And all the information for the event is listed there pretty prominently on the front page. Go there and RSVP. I would RSVP very soon. We're running out of space. Um, again, you can also watch it via live stream. If you want to sign up or get involved in the organization, you can also do it for our website, tv4a.org. Find out about some of our other projects in addition to strength and security. We do a lot of stuff with uh, Veterans Affairs, um, spending overall, and some other things as well. So please visit our website and you can find out more there. And I appreciate you guys having me on the show. Well, thank you so much. Again, Dan Caldwell is the Legislative Director for Concerned Veterans for America. Go check out all their stuff. We'll post it on our social media. And, Dan, unfortunately, I, I'm, I'm going to be in Washington at a four-day event uh, 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 training and stuff, so I won't be able to come, but I'm certainly going to watch it, and we'll be promoting it all week long. And we wish you good luck with the event, and we hopefully we'll be able to attend the other ones. Well, I appreciate it. Thank you for having me on your show again. No problem, Dan. We'll talk soon. Take care.